Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. Welcome to part two of Dialogue with Lytton with guest Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., son of the late President Franklin D. Roosevelt. It starts to accumulate. Here we are. Mr. Roosevelt, of course, your father was a very strong executive. Today we see a trend apparently for the pendulum to go in the other direction where leadership in the executive branch is being downgraded to a certain extent. Would you comment please on the balance between leadership and Congress as opposed to the executive branch? Well, really that boils down to, to personalities. Uh, for example, and this is not in any way derogatory of Carl Albert, the Speaker of the House, or of uh, Senator Mansfield, the Majority Leader of the, uh, of the Senate. Um, but I remember when uh, Speaker Bankhead or Speaker Rayburn uh, and uh, Lyndon Johnson was Majority Leader of the Senate. When you have strong leadership in the Congress, uh, it is respected, uh, the opinions are uh, very uh, imp paid a lot of attention to. I think a lot depends on the kind of leadership. Uh, now, uh, Ford, I don't think, could be compared in leadership qualities to FDR or Harry Truman, that great Missourian. But, uh, I think we have some Democrats coming along who are going to restore uh, the, the, the ability of a president with leadership uh, uh, talents uh, to lead. You know, there's a difference between types of leadership. Sam Rayburn had very dominating leadership. John Kennedy was not a dominating man, but he had a unique quality of leadership that caused people to want to follow. And when you have equality that causes people to want to follow you, it doesn't take as dominant a form of leadership. It's just a natural inclination for people to want to do as you say. So there's different kinds of leadership. The other thing I would say, and you mentioned about my, uh, Mike Mansfield and Carl Albert, there's a discussion of a lack of leadership there. And I, I don't think we want the kind of arm twisting that Sam Rayburn displayed and mm. perhaps uh, Lyndon Johnson to a way. All we'd like, at least what I would like in the House, is a little more direction. I don't necessarily want them to come to my office and twist my arm, but I would like for them to tap on the door and give us a little direction. I don't think the House has direction. I don't think the, the Senate has direction. I don't think the country has direction. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know where we're going. I think we'd like to so have somebody stand up and say, we're going that away. And then perhaps the people might be willing to follow. So I'd say we're... <laughs> I think we're short of leadership, but I think what we're really short of is direction or anybody to stand up and point. And, and Mansfield and Albert and others, unfortunately, I don't really think have. Very well put. We'll Very see. well put. I would like to pursue this subject of tax cuts just a little bit farther. Uh, <laughs> so with everybody. <laughs> yes. According to Philip Stern in his book, The Rape of the Taxpayer, he states that $60 billion uh, could be collected from those who are not paying their fair share of income taxes, which would make a tax cut of perhaps even as much as half for those in other income tax brackets. Well, one candidate for president on the Democratic side has uh, recommended a very major right. elimination of tax deductions. And that's a question that the Congress, the House and the Senate have wrestled with for many, many, many years. It's a very involved question. Um, I, I, I can't give you a quick answer to it. Sure, you can eliminate all deductions if you want to, and, uh, and then everybody pays uh, 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 their percentage of tax depending on what bracket they're in, and sure, we will have a reduction. 
everybody will pay less. Uh, that's one of the that's one of the ways to do it. Uh, I don't know. Let me comment to this extent, and I know that when you're running for office, a politically expedient thing to do is to stand up and say, close the loopholes, do all these things, and and uh, I'll say I'm for that. Now let's let's get to the honest answer to your question, the way I would perceive it. We've got to realize that our tax system in this country is not designed just to collect taxes or in our country. It's designed additionally to achieve certain social and economic objectives in a free society. So as to get people to do things that we would otherwise have to force them to do for the common good of all men. There are many aspects of our tax structure that do just that, the old uh, carrot approach as opposed to the stick, which I, I happen to support. Two or three quick examples. We permit deductions for charitable contributions to churches. Now that's not at all fair to the atheist. Not at all. But you see, we feel in government that a strong church, and a strong religious faith in God is important to a stable society. Consequently, we permit what is not a fair deduction to be a part of our tax system so as to encourage uh, a strong religious belief in strong churches. Secondly, we have a deduction in the interest rates, and this has been discussed during the course of the presidential campaign. One of the biggest loopholes is to permit the deduction of interest rates in your home. If that were eliminated, uh, it would increase the taxes uh, more than any other change. However, it's the feeling by government that people who own their own home, as opposed to those who rent, are more inclined to be a part of the PTA, to support the school bond issue, to be interested in good sewers, good streets, good libraries, good communities. Because they're part of the, of the structure, part of the system. They're here today, they've got payments on their house to the extent that they're not apt to be leaving for some time. Consequently, the deduction is permitted, although not fair, to those who don't wish to own their home, to achieve a social objective. We use our tax structure a great deal to uh, increase or to slow down our economy. Terribly important that we do this because in times of recession, we can use a tax system, you see, to stimulate the economy or in times uh, of inflation to slow it down. We permit a, an investment credit of 10% to those who are willing to go out and spend $100,000 for a generator or $40,000 uh, for a tractor. Now, that's not really very fair to the man on $10,000 a year salary who can't afford a generator or who doesn't want to buy a tractor. But if we don't permit the investment credit and encourage the purchase of the generator or the tractor to stimulate the economy, the man might not have a $10,000 salary at all because he might not have a job. So all of these things, you see, make our tax structure inequitable, very unfair, very unfair because we're using it not just to pull in revenue to run our country, but to achieve objectives that government feels are worthy. Now, I'm not trying to make an excuse for an inequitable tax system. There are loopholes, indeed. The minimum taxes that we pay, in my opinion, ought to be increased. Simply to say that everybody, no matter how many lawyers you hire or loopholes you can find, you're going to pay at least this much tax. That should come to pass. But to do away with all the various other things would perhaps deprive our government of the tool that it uses to achieve objectives we feel are good for many people. And that would be the excuse that I would offer. And I might add, many people never really think about it that way. And I think we ought to. Jerry, could I change the subject just a moment no. and lay politics aside? <laughs> and talk about something you both are experts on, that's the beef cattle business. I'd like to hear you both talk about, you sure knew when to get out, when are you going to get back in? <laughs> are some of the intellectuals likely to talk us out of eating beefsteak? I, 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 uh... I think the American people are not going to be talked out by either the professors or the intellectuals or even the doctors uh, uh, against eating beefsteak. That's the, that's the great American uh, dish and uh, luckily our livestock uh, and poultry uh, industry uh, meets the taste buds of the American people. You know, the intellectuals, back when we were talking about the shortage of food and the starving people of the world made their great speeches as to what would happen if we would not eat one hamburger a day and 
how many hungry people of the world we would save, which sounded logical until you simplified it and you suddenly realized that if we reduce our demand for beef in America, the result is a decreased price, the result being a decreased production, the result being less demand for corn, lower prices on corn, less corn planted, and we fed nobody in India. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's exactly right. These simplistic solutions I, uh, that, that get thrown out um, and just don't really add up. Uh, I, I do think, though, that we've, we've got to face up to uh, the problem of the producer, the farmer. And I was talking with somebody earlier, uh, Jerry, uh, I don't know what your uh, program is on this because we didn't rehearse any of this ahead of time. Uh, but I think that we've got to see to it that the farmer doesn't get stuck by quick short-term reverses of farm policy in Washington. And by that I mean uh, the embargo placed on, uh, after the Russians came in a couple of years ago, you remember that we had the embargo on, on uh, more uh, wheat sales to, to Russia and China in order to preserve the supply and keep the price down in the, in the domestic market. And we've seen a similar thing uh, on soybean oils, recent, uh, soybeans uh, recently. Uh, and what did the Japanese do? Uh, uh, they just went down to Brazil and, uh, and we lost the market. Mm. You negotiated, did you not, the first uh, major Russian wheat sale as Under Secretary of Commerce? I did. That's a funny story. Uh, <laughs> we ran into all kinds of problems afterwards. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I remember at one point the uh, uh, I had this, the Russian delegation sitting across the table, and George Ball, who was then Under Secretary of State, and I was Under Secretary of Commerce. Um, uh, we, we were sitting across from the Russians on the other side of the table, and the Russians said, "Well, of course, we want to uh, to transport all this grain." in Russian bottoms from the ports of export, to New Orleans and so forth. We want to uh, export it to Russia in Russian ships. Well, I had to say, well, of course, uh, Mr. Russian Minister, uh, you're touching on a very sensitive nerve because uh, we have a thing called the, Inter the International Longshoremen's Association, <laughs> the ILA. And, uh, they're going to insist that uh, if they're going to load the ships, which they got to do, uh, that they all, all this grain goes uh, in, in American bottoms. All the Russians said, we couldn't possibly pay for American ships. You have those high union rates for all your sailors and so on. I said, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but I said, you've got to remember that we've got free and independent trade unions in this country, and they don't give a damn about the federal government selling a lot of extra wheat. And they don't give a damn about the farmer. They just want to be free and independent trade unions. Well, of course, then I sat back for a one-hour lecture from the Russian minister telling me how free and independent were the Russian trade unions. <laughs> <laughs> so when he got all through, George Ball, this great diplomat sitting on my right, looked at me. I can't repeat what I said to the Russians. <laughs> but uh, it started off uh, with a four-letter word called bull. <laughs> and I thought, that, I thought George Ball was going to have a heart attack on my right. But to my amazement, the Russian minister across the table, he had a big smile, a great big chuckle, and he said, Mr. Roosevelt, we understand each other. <laughs> so needless to say, we negotiated a good uh, price, and we transported half in Russian bottoms and half in American bottoms, and everybody was happy. <laughs> Along this line, would you not say that, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but you've been there before. The longshoremen, <laughs> the longshoremen during their strike indicated their concern was the price of food of the consumer. I'm, I'm not, I don't buy that. They indicated 
that they were worried that if the wheat moved to the Russia that we would have expensive food. But that was not their concern in 19, what, 60, 62 when they were on strike. No. It was not their concern in 72 when they were on strike. And I doubt very seriously if it was in 75. What they were concerned about was, again, the percentage of, of, of the grain went on American flagships, right? Yeah, I think that was their primary concern. That's what and I uh, this is the interplay between unions. Uh, and of course, I must tell you that uh, I, I think we, 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 we've gotten to the point where I'm not so sure that the unions ought to be able to tell the farmers uh, uh, what ships the farmers sell to. <laughs> moves his grain into the world market. Uh, I think this is a, a very important question. This is where we get back to leadership. Uh, I think that a, a, a president who was a strong leader could get uh, farm leaders and labor leaders together and simply point out this problem. And uh, I think with some leadership, some um, some, some, some cooperative attitude of trying to solve a problem, I think we could reach a, a compromise and reach a solution. Because the real problem was that the Longshoremen strike occurred pretty much along the time when farmers in Kansas were preparing to make the decisions as to how much grain they were going to plant. Exactly right. And uh, the consumers should be aware of the fact that uh, here's a farmer. He's not sure whether he's going to plant 400 or 600 acres, whether he's going to put a lot of nitrogen or a little, how much fertilizer he's going to put on at all. He's not sure whether he's going to buy that $40,000 combine or not. If he does, he can harvest more with more efficiency. Mm -hmm. All of these decisions he's trying to make, and he's not even able to sell last year's crop. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I know that has to cause him to plant less, use less fertilizer, buy less machinery, produce less grain, which means the consumer's going to pay more next year, not less. And the consumer was never aware of this during the longshoreman strike. And the worker who, who makes that combine, he may be out of a job because not enough new combines are being sold. So this is how labor, the farmer, the longshoreman, the sailor on the ships, they're all tied together. Uh, you both have said that you're so interested in bringing the government back to the people. And I was just wondering what you thought of the validity of the uh, electoral, electoral college and also about the feasibility of a nationwide presidential primary. Well, <laughs> I've, I'll back him up this time. <laughs> tell you what I don't like, and then I'll tell you what I do. I don't like the idea of a handful of Democrats and Republicans in New Hampshire and Florida telling the other 48 states who we're going to have for our next president. I'd like to see us have regional primaries around the United States, say four of them. One of them perhaps a March 1, one April 1, one April 15, one May 1. The latter two can be closer together because we've started to, to develop a field toward the candidates. And have one in the east and one in the west and one in the midwest and one in the south or have four of them. Have those states in the midwest uh, have their primary on uh, April 15 or some specified date. And those states who wish to participate will uh, have the people go to the polls that day. Those who wish to uh, select their delegates in, in another fashion or manner would have that ability or opportunity also. That's what I'd like to see happen. What about the Electoral College having so much say about, or uh, the potential for so much say about who gets elected to be president? Do you think there should be any reform there? Or are you satisfied? I'm sure there have been ideas about making reforms, but it, uh, the, the major reform would be that the vote by state was proportional to the popular vote. Uh, in Angolia, since Russia was not confronted by the United States, what's to deter them from going to other countries and doing the same acts and deeds? Say, for example, Panama Canal. All right. I guess the question you're asking is, if we don't meet their, their uh, move in Angola, what will stop them from continuing elsewhere? First, let me say that I don't really believe that Russia has any intent to try to destroy us militarily. I think their <coughs> ultimate objective is to destroy us economically. And if we continue to permit Russia to call the shots, uh, as they did in South Vietnam, they could very well be successful. Uh, I happen to be a candidate for office. Uh, if my opponent were to designate where we were to debate, 
what we were to debate, the rules of the debate, how we were to do it, when it was to start, and when it would be held, and when it would be over, and I, I accommodated them each time. I hardly feel that you would want me to represent you in the United States Senate. What I'm suggesting is I think it's an error for Russia to walk to the world map, put an X on the map, designate where we will meet and how we will do it, and for us to accommodate. I think we ought to meet Russia head on, but I don't think we ought to let them pick the spot. And Angola is not the spot, and neither was South Vietnam. I agree. Jerry Rybray, Gladstone, I've got a kind of a loaded question I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Roosevelt. In view of the fact of the work that you did for John Kennedy in his successful election of presidency, do you have a candidate, a favorite candidate now that you're going to go out and work for? <laughs> or can you I, recommend I, one that you highly recommend? We're damn lucky in the Democratic Party. Uh, we've got uh, four or five really top men. I hated to see Birch by drop out because I have great respect for him. But he just ran out of, he, he ran out of steam. Uh, I have great respect for Hubert Humphrey, who is a non-candidate as of now. But I think, uh, in all honesty, I think uh, things are going to be thrown at Hubert, uh, which are going to make things difficult for him. We're very lucky to have uh, Scoop Jackson, who's had years of experience in the Senate. Um, I think Scoop does suffer from his earlier stand uh, on Vietnam, uh, uh, although I think he's largely overcome that. I haven't mentioned Jimmy Carter. I happen to think very highly of Jimmy Carter, but you know, I've been watching my pal here. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Jerry Litton are the kind of breath of fresh air of non-politician, straightforward, honest, decent guy who's going to tell you exactly the simple, straightforward truth of, to, in answer to your question, which he's been doing. <laughs> and I think Jimmy Carter, while he has changed his mind on some things, there's no question, uh, but all of us grow. Uh, but he's that same kind of uh, man of integrity that I think the people in America are looking for. Not, not only are these uh, meetings and functions very educational, help keep us more nearly involved in government, and we need in large part to thank your host for this, but also they're a whole bunch of fun. <laughs> and to, to know that we've got the opportunity to meet people such as you is... Uh, well, it says a lot for our system. And hopefully, Jerry Litton will be in a position where he can allow other people, a great many more than us, this same opportunity as your father did at one time. We need to be involved. And in order to be involved, we need to be inspired. And one way to be inspired is to have people such as you and our congressmen come and let us know what is happening and why. My question. Jerry has this freshness, as do some of the other people that are relatively young and new and vibrant and enthusiastic and energetic that come into our field of politics. How do we more nearly equalize people that are not yet, or the opportunities for those are, that are not yet in politics, to get into it when there are those that have been in there forever or whose fathers have been in there forever? How do you equalize? How do you open up the gates of opportunity? Right. Well, I think one of the things is to, is to stimulate our young people. I met one fellow before this program who's 14 years old, and he's read every book he can lay his hands on about the, my mother and my father. That's because he's fascinated by that, the Roosevelt era, if you want to call it that. Now, the fact that he is coming to this program and getting the stimulation and the education that Jerry Litton gives him every month, uh, aided and abetted by a, a few uh, has-beens like myself. Uh, but uh, seriously, if we can take those young people, boys and girls, stimulate them through this kind of a program, and I hope that the high schools 
and the colleges are taking this program in their political science classes and playing it because I think if I was a, a political science professor, I, I'd be sure that either on a voluntary basis or otherwise that the young students um, got the benefit of this kind of a program. It's a town meeting. And I think if we can stimulate their interest at an early age, then I think they're going to go on, Mark, to, uh, to take an active role in politics. They're going to get into a Senate campaign of Jerry Litton. And they're going to learn the ropes. Let me say something that some of you may not be aware of here. With the Roosevelt name, one would think that Franklin would just have moved on into politics on the basis of his name, but if you'll study your history books and his election to Congress in New York, he didn't do it by stepping in easily. He did it by busting Tammany Hall. He was not part of the machine or part of the establishment. He was on the outside forcing his way in, and many of the periodicals covering his first election pointed to his election to the United States Congress as the first break in the wall of Tammany Hall. And I think many people are just not aware of that. And uh, that he was a fresh face when he broke in. Okay. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Roosevelt whether or not he didn't think that maybe the convention might be brokered. The one thing I think that the uh, majority of Democrats do not want is a repetition of the 1924 convention. See, I'm showing my age now. I went there at the age of 10. And uh, so now you got it all figured out. <laughs> well, uh, we went to 104 ballots before finally John W. Davis was nominated. In those days, we had the two-thirds rule. You had to get two-thirds of the delegates in order to get nominated. Uh, my father nominated Al Smith in 24. Uh, in the now famous Happy Warrior speech. And it was his first return to public life after he was stricken with polio in 1921. And as he struggled on his crutches to the platform, only about 10 paces after being lifted out of his chair by my brother Jimmy and his, um, his um, bodyguard, uh, he struggled on his crutches. And just as he got his hands on that rostrum, with these strong arms and shoulders and these crippled legs, the sun, they do this before the days of spotlights, the sun shone through a window high in the old Madison Square Garden and illuminated his head and shoulders. It was one of the most dramatic scenes you will ever see in your life. I can remember it as long as I live. Uh, and this was his return, that Happy Warrior speech. I didn't mean to digress on a personal story. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I think there is a possibility that this will be a brokered convention. Well, you know, we've, we've had a marvelous time visiting today, and, and uh, I want to thank Franklin for coming from New York uh, all the way out here to Missouri to visit with us. I've been a great admirer of, of him and his work and his family for many, many years, and he and his family represent excitement and hope and enthusiasm for a lot of people. And I think it's great that we have not only a number of older people that came out to hear you and see you and meet you, but an awful lot of young people that came out. And I think they're looking to that hope that, that your family and you represent, Franklin. Thanks for coming here. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you very much. You have been watching Dialogue with Lytton, now in its fourth year of taking government to the people. Congressman Jerry Lytton believes that government should be more open and accessible to the people, that people should have more say in their government. And that's what Dialogue with Lytton is all about. Be sure to continue to watch it on this station.